now the uh, title of my talk is The Babel Delusion, uh, and the subtitle is uh, 4,000 Years of Religious and Political Fantasy. Um, it's, it started with me because I have this little Bible framework series that I do, uh, largely because when I was a new Christian in college, uh, a chemistry professor spoke to some of us young guys and he said, you men are going to face all kinds of pressures here. You're not going to have time with the math and the physics and so forth to go detailing into commentaries or something. But what you've got to figure out is a method of going through the Bible mentally, section by section, in the sense of the large ideas of the Bible. This is, not a, uh, this is just a tool, it's not a substitute for verse by verse teaching. It was just a, a tool so that we could think through the big ideas of scripture and, and frame an issue in that light. So um, I noticed, um, I was down at Liberty University and I was talking to students and I realized I left out the section on Babel. I mentioned it, but I didn't really develop it. And I thought, well, we got to develop it. And then I thought, well, <clears throat> um, we're talking about the deterioration in our culture. Uh, and Babel is an interesting prototype. So my approach in this talk is going into a lot of the <clears throat> background of the times in which Babel likely occurred. Uh, a lot of it's speculation in the sense we don't, the word of God doesn't give us a lot of titles, uh, a lot of information on that. But it goes back to the work, actually, of Henry Morris. Um, I'm going to address Dr. Morris and the Creation Science Group because they, I'm relying upon some of their research to figure out what was going on on Earth to give a geophysical context of the Tower of Babel. And it's, I think it will help us realize <clears throat> that we haven't changed, there's no new thing under the sun. <clears throat> and so the crises that the Babel people faced largely parallel the crises that we, we face today. So uh, the, the, um, the framework just basically looks at these events and it, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a summary, that's all it is, it's just pegs to go through sequencing one event after another. And of course, Babel is the one that falls right after the flood. And to deal with the flood, we have to deal with a problem that I see in Old Testament commentaries. It seems that many, not all, but many evangelical Old Testament people uh, start out, they read Genesis 1, they read Genesis 2, read Genesis 6 about the flood, uh, and they, they see what the Bible text is saying, but then in the background of their thinking, they're thinking old earth. They're thinking of millions and millions of years of earth, and that the Bible can't be right. So we have to rethink our hermeneutics when we interpret Genesis 1 to 11. And perfectly good exegetes, but I think they miss the whole point of the Genesis narrative. It's not that hard to understand. So. Let me go to the slide of uh, Dr. Morris. And uh, here's a comment he made uh, toward the end of his life. It's one of the comment, last comments he made before he died. And uh, he says this, it's long seemed anomalous to me as a professional scientist and non-professional Bible reader that the modern revival of literal Biblical creationism has been largely, has been mostly by scientists rather than theologians. It is true that there are, and I wanted to see these two paragraphs because Dr. Morris was very, very loyal to the authority of the text. And look what he says in the second paragraph. It is true that there are many good scientific evidences pointing to special creation, a young earth, and a global flood. But the compelling and definitive evidences are biblical, not scientific. Science and the scientific method do support creation, but can never prove creation or disprove evolution. 
nor can it determine the age of the earth or prove there was a worldwide deluge in the prehistoric past. The Bible is explicitly clear on these issues, however. There is not even a hint of evolution or the long ages implied by evolution in the Bible. Neither is there any biblical intimation that the Genesis flood was a local flood. One does not have to be a theologian or a Bible scholar to see this. It's quite evident to anyone who simply reads the Bible and believes it to be the inerrant word of God. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to show you uh, another slide here and then we'll, I want to show a demonstration. This, uh, this particular slide, it's got fine detail in it, don't worry about it. Um, the big idea on this, this chart is I'm trying to show the limitations of the scientific method. The, the light blue square is the domain of our personal experience and knowledge. The y-axis on this is, is, is uh, distance and the horizontal axis is time. So in time and space, we only have our lifetimes. We only have that experience. Uh, the dark blue is people who have lived before us and we learn from their experience. The yellow is how we amplify our knowledge by measurements, by using instruments. And there are methods that this involves some sophistication and method, um, measurement technology. But the big idea, carry away, is not all that. The big idea is the block as you go right on the chart. There's something missing. There is no knowledge to the right of that vertical uh, line. And the reason for that is nobody can measure. There's no measurements and there's no observations. You can't go into the future because the future hasn't come to us, so there's no measurements in the future. Nor can we go into the distant past where there were no measurements. And to show you why this is so important, so you'll understand the difference between ordinary everyday science and something called historical science. So I've asked David Ice at the back of the room to grab an end of this string or this line. I'm going to stand here and from now to, to David, this is about 90, uh, 69 feet. And if you look at the length of this um, and you, you say, well, if man has been on Earth, say, four million years, the length of this string at 69 feet is, it, let that be four million years on a time scale. If that's the case, how much of this time scale do we have any measurements for? One inch. And if we take that, on the other hand, all the way back to the uh, usual 4.5 billion years, for the universe and for the earth, and we say, okay, how much of this timeline do we have any measurements for? It would be one thousandth of an inch. Now take a good look at this. From my finger to David is speculation. It's not science, and the reason it can't be science is because there aren't any measurements. And yet everybody assumes that this, this thing, is, we've been taught it in our secular education for so many years, it's just subliminal. Okay, Dave. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the issue. So when we get into the Old Testament history, we have to say, okay, what were the measurements doing? Do we have any measurements for this, this sort of thing? Um, we all are familiar with Darwin and evolution. But Darwin really wasn't the issue here because Darwin would never have been successful had it not been for another man. This man lived at the beginning of the 1800s. Uh, his name is Lyell, and Lyell was a lawyer. He was also an amateur geologist, but he had more money than the, amateur, the other amateur geologists, and he did what we do today is he commandeered, he started a journal, and he commandeered the editorial power of that journal to ban flood geologists. 
So he deliberately kept and suppressed the work that the flood geologists were doing and promulgated long ages. Now here are some excerpts to show you that Lyell was very conscious of what he was doing. He says, old Fleming is frightened and thinks the age, uh, thinks the age will not stand my anti-mosaic conclusions. Talking about age of England at that time, about 1820. Um, and Fre F Fleming was an older man that was involved with some, trying to sell Lyell's view to the clergy of England. And he was afraid, he was timid to do that, but you notice what Lyell is saying here, anti-Mosaic conclusions. And then he says, if you don't triumph over them, this is to he, a letter, another letter that he wrote to the, one of the editors of his journal, if you don't, and watch what she's doing here, he knows the clergy have committed to a Mosaic cosmology, and somehow he has to undermine confidence in the Bible. So he says this, if you don't triumph over them, but compliment the liberality and candor of the present age, the bishops and the enlightened saints will join us. And then another comment he makes that's interesting is the physical part of geological inquiry ought to be conducted as if the scriptures were not even in existence. So that's the background. I've shown you the, the, the idea there's no measurements to back this up. This is just extrapolation of, of you know, from my one inch on the screen all the way back to where David is, is standing. If those of you want to look at a very good piece of work, Terry Mortensen works for AIG. When he went to get his doctorate, he chose to go to England so he could get access to the old libraries. And he went back into the old libraries to find the notes of the early flood geologists. And he saw very clearly that they were being excluded from publication, something that, by the way, is happening today. And so, um, keep in mind, this is, by 1830, this thing had been sold to the, to the public. Now, when did Darwin start? He published in 1859, or roughly 1860. That's 30 years after this guy. Had this man not had the old age, Darwin would never have had enough time to make evolution work or seem plausible. So keep in mind, it was the geology, not the biology, that set this whole thing in motion. And so as a result, um, of course, coming down, that was 1830, the Christian Bible people uh, decided that, oh gosh, we've got to accommodate old age into the, into the Bible somehow. So right there, they're following an illusion. And we have a situation where the hermeneutic of interpreting Genesis 1, 2, all the way up to 9 was changed to accommodate this kind of thing. So we have a hermeneutical distortion that was created basically by a, a massive speculation. Um, so along come Mor Morris and Whitcomb. By the way, ICR has a nice table out there. Jim Johnson is, is showing you some of the books. And ICR was started basically by Henry Morris. Henry Morris wrote The Genesis Flood in 1960. That was the book that was a literal bombshell inside evangelical Christians. Because Whitcomb and Morris had spent 10 years developing all kinds of evidence to show that if you take, you start with the authority of scripture and then go out into general revelation and use your special revelation to interpret your general revelation, then you can make advances. Well, that was 1960, so this is 60 years later. We've had 60 years of developing a community of PhD creation scientists, and they've done wonderful work. So I'm gonna to refer to that work as the background for Genesis 9. Um, a little side note here, and that is that when Whitcomb and Morris wanted to publish their manuscript after they worked on it for 10 years, they could not get one dispensational publisher to publish it. And that's because 
all the dispensational publishers had bought in to day age or something else uh, to make get get the speculation into the text and adjust the hermeneutic. So Rush, Rush's Rush Dune, he was a theonomist, post-millennial, but he was very politically and philosophically acute. And he took one look at this manuscript and he said, this manuscript has got to be published. And he knew his Sam Craig, who owned Presbyterian Reform Publishing Company. He said, Sam, get this book published. And that's why to this day you pick this thing up and it's Presbyterian Reformed Publishing Company, and you wonder, what did they have to do with this? Well, they were the only people who wanted to publish it. So they, um, they, they've done a lot of work uh, that grace and scientists have done. And what I wanted to do with this Babel topic is to show you that 2 Peter 3, 5, and 7, who talks about the new heavens and the new earth. What we need to do in our mind's eye as we go through this is think that the people who lived and survived the flood experienced a new heavens and a new earth. So this kind of gives you, the, and I'm going to go into the geological and climate differences here. So it helps us in prophecy when we see that we're heavens and earth to think of it in, in more concrete terms. What does a new heavens and a new earth look like? Well, we've already had one new heavens and one new earth. That we've had, we're in the second civilization of man. We have the first civilization from Adam to Noah. We have a disaster at the end of that first civilization. And now we're in the second civilization. And that's gonna end in judgment too. The judgment's not gonna be tremendously different uh, from the judgment on the first, uh, uh, the first civilization. Um, but there's, a, there's an authentication that's happened here that I want to mention. To make Lyell's position, he has, to, uh, he has to have some way of describing millions of years. And the way he does it is a, is a doctrine. And the doctrine is called uniformitarianism. It's called other things today, more sophisticated. But basically, here's what it's, he's saying. He's saying that I go out and I observe processes going on today. And what I have to do is I have to assume that those processes have always, trend, always gone on. That the age, for example, evolu uh, erosion. Erosion is slow. And so erosion to make the rocks, the sedimentary rocks, it took a long, long time uh, to, 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 for the erosion to take place. That's called uniformitarianism. You keep the processes that you've observed and you extrapolate them backwards. But we have two events at Lee, we have many events, but I'll give you two. Two events that disprove Lyell's uniformitarianism. Uh, one uh, was in May 18th of uh, 1980, Mount St. Helens exploded in Washington State. The significance of that event is that we have video of it happening. So this is a measured, observed event of powerful geological actions that happened fast. It happened one morning. And along down that, down that uh, volcanic uh, mountain there, they came what is called a slurry mix. And according to the video, it probably came down at a rate of 60 to 90 miles an hour. And it was turbulence. And the mystery is that after it descended, got down in the bottom, we come back two years later and we've got a mini Grand Canyon there. All level, nice stratified things. How the heck did it get stratified in such a neat way when it was a slurry mix of turning debris, rocks, soil, trees, water, sliding down at 60 miles an hour? How did that wind up with making this beautiful laminar thing that looks like the Grand Canyon on a smaller scale? So what's the conclusion of what happened on May 18th? It's a fast geological event that violates uniformitarianism. It's just one event. I'll give you a second one. March 11th in 2011. You've heard, seen the movies of the tsunami, 
uh, in, in Japan that wrecked the nuclear power plant. We all saw that water cascading onto the east coast of Japan. Um, it was a magnitude 9-0 earthquake. And what happened to cause that earthquake is that underneath the continents, around the mantle of the earth, there are what called tectonic plates. And Japan and its islands are on one tectonic plate. Pacific Ocean is on another one. And apparently what happened is the tectonic plates are moving just a little bit against each other. And it snagged. And all of a sudden, the, the, the tectonic plate under, the, under the Japan slipped. And um, when it slipped, it moved the entire nation of Japan eight feet east in 15 minutes. So that tells you the magnitude of forces. And that was just a minor slip. And the interesting thing about this is because creation science today believes that that's one of the things that God used with the flood. You know how Africa and South America fit together. Well, it, those two tonic plates split apart and moved those continents at a pretty fast rate. But Lyell had no idea of this. So um, the other thing that's happened is that the, um, uh, here, here's Jake Hebert, who's a um, geologist at ICR. He says this, most creationists think that during the flood, the original ocean floor was rapidly subducted into the Earth's mantle and was replaced with a new sea floor at mid-ocean ranges. The heat from the newly formed sea floor significantly warmed the world's oceans, resulting in greatly increased evaporation from the sea's surface. This dramatically increased the moisture in the atmosphere and led to greater precipitation, including more snowfall at high latitudes and on mountaintops. So <clears throat> creation science has tried to explain now if we understand the flood to be this way, it follows that an ice age would follow that. So here's the model, picture of it. The idea is the oceans got very hot. They got hot because in the tsunami you've got volcanic actions and so on. And we're talking a hot ocean. We're talking an ocean temperature in the 80s. And so what happens then is that we have the evaporation off the oceans causing precipitation and in the northern latitudes the precipitation is, comes out as snow and it's interesting but the creation model of the ice age is the only one that works no one has ever figured out how do you get an ice age because here's what you have to do you have to get enough snow to have really high buildup on the, on the continents but then how do you keep it from melting in the summer? And so that's a dilemma. But this model solves the problem because with the volcanic activity, you have aerosols, it's probably a very dark time. So you have very little solar radiation. If you had solar panels, they wouldn't work here. And so you have a, a, a tremendous um, darkness on the earth. And during the summertime, it doesn't melt. So the idea then is that we have the, um, let's see, this is the average ocean temperature, yeah. Here's a model, it's a model, and it'll probably be, have to be adjusted, but here are godly men who are taking the scripture seriously and thinking through from what we know and can observe about science, how, what would have happened if we had had a flood? And you have the warm ocean temperatures, uh, that's Celsius t uh, scale, and then you have the flood. Uh, the x-axis on this graph is time. And the uh, vertical axis is temperature. So here's the hot oceans. Now they're cooling because once the volcanic activity calms down, they start to cool because it's not an equilibrium temperature. So it goes down, it descends until it gets down to about five degrees C. But notice on the time axis, it takes seven centuries to do that. So the theory is after the flood for 700 years, you would have an advancing ice age, and then eventually the oceans cool down to pretty much what they are today. Okay, that's the temperature of the ocean. 
But the thing about Babel is that those people lived during this time. This would have been the time of uh, the, the Ice Age, and it would be changing climate. So interestingly, one of the fearful things that they faced as a population, small population basically, would be the fact that earth tremors. What would that do to your architecture? If you have an unstable earth, if you try to build something, you've got to have a big base. And so probably another reason besides the theological reason is that's why you have pyramids, ziggurats, and so forth. So for 700 years, it takes the, the ocean to cool. But meantime, here's something else. If the water from the precipitation is going on land and staying on the land in the form of ice, what's happening to the ocean depth? It's, it's lowering. Why? Because you've got all your water being moved onto land and it stays on land because it's ice. So now we have another phenomena. We have the, um, the ocean depth start to go. The dashed line across there is our present ocean sea level. So you have above the, that area would have been the hot times, would have been a lot of rain right after the flood, but then ice forms. And so what happens to the depth of the sea of the ocean? It starts to sink because the ocean's not getting the water back that's on land in the form of ice. Notice again the time. It'd be 500 to, 500 to 700 years. And then the, as soon as the um, ice age settles and the oceans cool, the cycle stops, <clears throat> then it starts to melt. And then it goes up like this. Here is the uh, comment from Michael Ord. Michael Ord is an atmospheric scientist, actually, that got into geology. And Michael has gone around and done a lot of field work. Here's what he says. And he's the one that devised this model, and ICR is now improving it. Immediately following the flood, sea level begins about 40 meters higher than at present, since the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets had not yet formed. The lowest great, uh, glacial sea level, of course, occurs at glacial maximum when the largest volume of water is locked up as ice on land. After maximum glaciation, and the, uh, the Laurentine, that's the Western Hemisphere, and the Scandinavian ice sheets would ra melt rapidly. Immediately after they melted, the sea level would have been a little higher than today because the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets would not yet have reached their present size. Sea level would then slowly descend to the current value. So we have something else happening. And here is how one of the two blessings that God gave the Babel population. One of them was, in Genesis 9, what does God do? He makes a contract, a covenant, a covenant with Noah. It's a geophysical covenant. What does he promise Noah? The seasons will not change. There will be geophysical stability. So there's the promise of God. The Babel population had to respond to that. Either they accept it or they, in fear, say, oh, the nature's out of control. We've got to do something. Sound familiar? And so they, we have two things. We have an earthquaking thing. We have climate change going on on a scale that is unprecedented, unprecedented levels of climate change. And the question that people have to face is, are you going to trust the Lord and his word and his promises or are you going to be in fear and you're going to go desperately into, into some sort of human gimmick? Well, um, we want to move on to another question, and that is um, this point about um, gaps in the genealogy, because we like to kind of get it tight about when did Babel happen. And so here's a work that's been done, again, by Terry Mortensen uh, up at uh, AIG. And they wrote, um, wrote a book called Biblical Authority in the Age of the Earth. 
Since the 19th century, Old Testament scholars have generally expressed the opinion that the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 contain generational and chronological gaps. Thus, they cannot be used, as James Usher did, for chronological purposes. Such a view, however, is troubling to some conservative Bible scholars who insist that Genesis 5 and 11 clearly present a continuous and no-gap genealogy and chronology from Adam to Abraham. Thus, they say, Usher justifiably used them to help date creation at about 4000 BC, and modern scholars would do well to follow suit. But he also follows up with the details because obviously there's quite a few people who want gaps in there and think they have good reasons for saying that. The main argument for gaps due to fluidity in the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 suffer from lack of evidence. All parties readily acknowledge fluidity in some ancient genealogies. No party has yet presented sound evidence of fluidity in the Sethite and Shemite lists. As far as the biblical evidence is concerned, no emissions or additions have been made to Genesis 5 and 11. There are gaps there. There are no gaps there. This conclusion leads to two obvious and important implications for those who trust the Bible. First, the numbers supplied in Genesis 4, and there's an error in this text. It should be Genesis 11 can and should be used for chronological purposes. Second, mankind is only about 6,000 years old. Now in that book, and I don't have time to go through it here, um, but they also deal with a Canaan thing that's in Luke, is also in, um, in Genesis, I think Genesis 11 there. Um, he, he deals with all that, and again, you can get the details in his, his discussion. Now there's another thing, again, thinking of the sea level dropping. This would have allowed, if the sea level really did drop and you, because of the ice, what does that do to the Bering Sea? Think about crossing from the northwest, uh, northeast part of Asia and the northwest part of the North American continent. If the sea levels dropped, they could have walked across and carried herds of animals across from Asia to America. And they wouldn't have to have a lot of boats to carry all the animals and so on. Also, another place on Earth that might have been the case, um, through Indonesia and uh, the Median Islands there uh, to Australia. And it would also solve a perennial problem evolutionists have had why is the subcontinent of Australia the only real place on the earth that has marsupials of different kinds? What, and usually the explanation is, well, they, they evolved in place. Yeah, but if it's only 6,000 years, they didn't have time to evolve in place. So could it have been that as the first generation or second generation of the ark, uh, they began to have herds of animals, small herds, and uh, maybe, maybe somebody decided, well, I'm going to emigrate to such and such a place, and I'm going to take all these guys, who happen to be marsupials. And so we have called that anthropogenic uh, introduction of a species unto land. Um, so to explore that, here's another great providential thing that God occurred. He, he had, with the Ice Age dropping the sea level, it was an optimum time to carry out two commands of God. Genesis 1, God said, go and fill the earth. In Genesis 9, God said, go and fill the earth, which means they have to disperse. And so if that is case, right around Babel time, God had prepared by lowering the sea level an opportune time to migrate. To explore this a little bit further, uh, one of Dr. Morris's students back many years ago, um, Andrew Woods, no relation, I don't think, to Andy, um, was a physicist there that did some interesting computer work. What he did, we won't get into all the details, but he decided to divide the Earth on a computer grid and only put grids, square grids, where there was land. Don't put any square grids where there's water. So he's measuring just the land surface. 
So he divided land areas of the earth into 449 small equal areas. For each such land area, he calculated the distance from it to every other land area under the whole earth. So here's, one, here's a land area and he's, he's, he's studying how far this particular land square is from all the other land squares. And um, had an interesting, fascinating conclusion. From the results of two, he added up all the distances calculated and divided by the number of individual distance calculations to get the average distance from the reference block used in point two to all the other land areas. Now, it gets clear as we go through this. He repeated the stage two and three for each one of the 449 land unit areas that existed by step one. Finally, he compared the average distances calculated for each reference land area to find the land unit area with the lowest distance which the Earth, which would be the Earth's geographical center. What he's trying to say here is, which area could you migrate from that would be, have the least travel time to fill the Earth? Here's, here's what he found out. This is Morris's comment on Andrew Wood's work. The most significant conclusion is that the geographical center of the earth is located in the so-called Bible lands. If we consider the Bible lands to be bounded roughly by Memphis, the capital of ancient Egypt on the southwest corner, and with Ararat on the northeast corner, then this would include Babylon, which is latitude 33 and longitude 44, and Jerusalem, latitude 32 and longitude 35, as well as practically all the sites in which the events narrated in the Old Testament took place. Now, the, the, what he found in this was that the, let me get the, Get the text here so I give you the right numbers. The exact geographical center of the earth it, for land areas is a latitude 39 and longitude 34. Here's the significance. Lat longitude 34 goes through Ankara, the present capital of Turkey. Latitude 39 goes through Mount Ararat. Now what's fascinating here is how far was this away? The probability of one place on the earth that would be the center and the lowest distance from all the other places is exactly the Bible lands. Bible lands. If that's the case, consider the fact that they are migrating out from this area. The travel distances, I think I have this on the next slide, or no, I don't. Um, let me get the get the travel distances, yeah. Um, let's see, where, where is the travel distances here? I, th I think I mentioned it later, but anyway, the, tra the travel distances, the average travel distance to every point on land from the Babel lands would be about 4,500 miles. The worst place to be, to migrate over the earth, would be between, be f if you started, uh, east of lower tip of Australia and west of the lower tip of South America, it would be 7,000 miles to every other area on earth. So here we have God, consider all the chaos of the flood. Here we have the Lord working to create an opportune location to build a second civilization. The turbulent, the, you know, here's the ark floating on all the chaos, and God, and you know, it's the, he, he's waiting for the flood to recede, and so the flood subsides, and the ark just happens to land in this area that becomes the Bible lands, which also happens to be the minimum area to migrate from. So that's just kind of a that gives you the background of the, the uh, geophysical background. Uh, around the time of the Babel incident. Um, but we also have another thing here. Uh, w the, the geophysical environment of Babel basically gives two crises and two blessings of God. 
the crises are you've got an unstable earth shaking, you've got uh, unprecedented climate change. The people came off the ark and everyone, the grandchildren, and everybody else, they never experienced seasons like this. And so you have those two can be fear mongers. But they also had two blessings. They had the covenantal promise of, to Noah that the, I'm putting a ceiling on all this. Yes, there's some chaos going on, but I'm going to limit it. And the seasons are not going to change. I guarantee that. And the second blessing was that I, I'm going to put you in an area where you can follow what I told you to do, which is go fill the earth. Okay, that's the geophysical context. Now we get into something else, the populational context. So we've looked at the, the, the environment, nature, the environment. Now we're going to look at what's happening to the physiology of man. You have people living prior to the flood that lived 800, 900 years. Clearly they're living with different bodies than we have. And then after the flood, we have this kind of a thing happen. And it's interesting that, um, let's see, I think I have, let's see slide four, let's see if I go back a minute here. Yes, uh, here's Randy Price's comment. He's talking about the Sumerian king list. So here's an ancient pagan document. Um, and Dr. Price is, is commenting on it. The Sumerian king list records the names of 10 Sumerian kings who ruled before the flood. The unrealistically long lifespans for these kings, ranging from tens of thousands of years, the longest is 43,200 years, might suggest this is a fictional account. However, some of the names are known from other inscriptions and appear to be historical figures. For this reason, the majority of scholars accept the Sumerian king list as historical record and explain the extreme reigns as uh, named after dynastic rulers or the whole dynasty, or an, an inter intentional literary hyperbole to enhance the prestige of the rulers. With respect to this text in Genesis, what is significant is the fact that you've got the same pattern of high longevity and then it descends. So, um, how, what do we do with this? Well, if you plot this out, take an Excel spreadsheet, and you plot the ages after the flood, you see what's happening. They are decreasing. But what's fascinating is you can curve fit it. Excel has a little curve fitting subroutine, and you get an exponential decay curve. And what's important about that is if in physics or chemistry, when you have an equilibrium condition and you change it, I mean, just dropping ice in water, if you had a thermometer and you took the temperature of the water and the, you drop a whole bunch of ice in there, it's going to cool. But it cools in this curve. Capacitors discharge like this. So that suggests something real going on here. I go through uh, some of the math on this stuff. and Again, I refer you to the paper so we can get through the, the presentation. Um, if you take literally the Genesis text, um, take the scriptures and ask yourself, when after the flood did these guys die? And it, Mo, uh, Noah lived for 350 years after the flood. Now look at what's happening to the age of death after the flood. You see Shem, he lived 502 years after the flood. Uh, Fox had lived 440 years, Selah lived 470, Ebor lived 531, but look what happened to Peleg. Peleg only lived 340. And then you have Rave, 770 and so forth and so on. Abraham would be uh, 467. And of course, again, I go into it in the text that people can speculate and say when was the... When was the um, the, the flood and so forth. Well, if you knew Abraham's, the date of Abraham's death, you could work backwards with these numbers and figure out when the flood occurred. And of course, you'd have to deal with the, the gap 
uh, in time in Egypt, if you took the 215 years in Egypt time, the flood would come out to be 2337. If you took the 400 years in Egypt, it would come out 2517. So, it's, again, we can play with these numbers, but the Bible gives us quite a bit of information here. What is intriguing is that look at the age Abraham died. And look when he died, 400 and, uh, no, look at Terah, his father, 427. And count up the bold numbers and see how many of the antediluvians died within 100 years of Abraham. There's a whole cluster of them apart from Shem uh, and, and Eber. Uh, they, they died. What do you think would have happened to this? If you had your great-grandfathers or your great-great-grandfather still living and your parents die before your great-grandfather, you'd think something's going on here with us. We're getting unhealthy or something's going on. So <clears throat> we have a situation where the only way to describe it must be that it was a civilization-wide Alzheimer's where suddenly you have a curtain that comes down on history. You have no more eyewitnesses. And I think it's intriguing that God called the Jews into existence right at the time when the, the eyewitnesses to past history were dying off. And the Jewish people then become the custodians of revelation. I think that's interesting. Um, Morris also deals with population equation. Again, we won't go into all the details, but um, this equation says how many people, total number of individuals be in the world after n generations, assuming no deaths. Uh, he, this was part of his Griffith Thomas lectures at Dallas Seminary many, many years ago. <clears throat> and so uh, Dr. Morris worked this all out. You can, again, it's not the absolute numbers. The point is you can plug, num plug things into this and get a feel for how fast populations would have expanded if you had very little death in the population. N would be the number of family generations. C would be the number of boys or girls in a family. So a, a family would say 2C. That would be the boys and the girls. And you can play with the numbers and so on. And uh, in the paper, I go through how to estimate C, the average number of boys, just from the, from the genealogical data, the average family would have uh, 6.75 boys or girls, which would be about 13 boys, 13 children. And then you drive the end and go through the whole population. And with just plugging the numbers in, I got a, a found figure of 15,920 would be the rough population at the time of Babel. Small enough to raise another question. And that is, where was the biblical influence on the population that built Babel? What happened to Shem? He, he was but had been living there. What about the, the men closer to the flood that we were the godly line? What happened to the witness of believers in that kind of a population? If the population was only 15,900, those guys were known around, did they have any retardant influence on their culture? Well, Dr. Price goes on and he, he talks about the later ziggurats that, um, ba in Babylon and, and, and what they meant, the architectural symbology. So now we get into the theology. And here's where the theology um, of the architecture. And here's what uh, Rainey says. The cigarettes consist of states of towers stacked one upon another, decreasing in size as they progress upward, similar in early form to the step pyramid. The ziggurat was dedicated to the city's patron deity and topped by a figure of a god or goddess. The temple of the ziggurat had both a cultic function and a cosmic function, linking heaven and earth or heaven and the netherworld. Texas associate the sanctuary uh, and the ziggurat with a cosmic mountain, which is typically identified in this mythology with a divine abode. The stairway supporting the structure to, of the ziggurat was the access point for gods to travel between heaven and earth. The biblical text says that the purpose of the Babel structure was to prevent the people from being scattered abroad. 
in contrast to God's commands. In other words, the verse describes an urbanization project, and I think he puts it so well, describes an urbanization project to keep the population together around a single administrative complex with a temple at its center. This urbanization process contributed to the deification of human rulers who maintain control, note the word control, over the city. And so you have a cult forming here. And so notice the parallels, to no new, new thing under the sun. Here you have a tyrannical control operating on the basis of fear. Now, I, I show this, and, and Carl T. Robb went through this in his section, but we only have two worldviews, either Genesis 1 and 2 or Genesis 3. Genesis 1 and 2, we have a whole tradition there. We also have the pagan model there with continuity of being. The key takeaway here for our purposes is notice the creator-creature distinction. On the left side of the chart, we have two existences, the existence of God and creatures. You don't violate that distinction. You don't mix gods and men. God is God and men are men. Yes, there are divine counsel and angels and all that, but they aren't God. They may be called gods, plural, but God is God above all gods. You have man and nature. These are everlasting distinctions. On the right side of the chart, if, and this is Satan's lie to Eve, that the word of God is not authoritative, and if you just eat that tree, you can have divine knowledge. And in this side, nature is all there is. There's no two, two existences. There's no creator-creature distinction. It's just nature. Well, nature then means everything. The gods, nature, man, angels, everybody is all part of this continuity. And that means there are no hard and fast barriers to transforming from one to the other. And I see right here that this pagan thing has taken us over now with transgenderism and everything else because boundaries don't matter anymore. It's not whether you're a man or a woman. It's not even whether you're an angel or a man. It's all one nature. And that comes out of Genesis chapter 3. So that's the basic theological background of Babel. And so how, what, what's the defense of the people? The, if there were believers at Babel, and there must have been, what were their sources of information from the Word of God? Well, we know God two ways. And again, that's been mentioned several times here. One is the universal sense of deity. And we have God consciousness or sense of deity. And here is Dr. Oliphan at uh, Westminster talking about the universal sense of deity. Now this doesn't save, but it renders us responsible. We know God not because we have reasoned our way to him or have worked through the necessary scientific procedures or have inferred his existence from other things we know. We know him by way of revelation. We have the sense of deity because we are God's image and because as image, God implants a knowledge of himself within each of us. Paul regards SD, talking now about Romans 1, that passage we've mentioned several times in this conference, regards SD as knowledge itself that comes directly and repeatedly from God through the things of everyday life. So that's one way. Now that doesn't tell us the gospel, but it renders us responsible. Now we also know that people after the flood knew parts of the word of God. So in addition to the sense of deity is the, what I call the Noahic Bible. And we have evidences of this. Here is a Christian couple, also a Chinese person guided them. They went into the most ancient symbols of China and they were oracle bones. And so, interesting, you go from left to right. Uh, there, there's a symbol for create, and then there's a, that's a conglomeration of, of dust, 
a mouth, a breath of life, and then they combine talking and walking. It's a living person. Maybe more clear is the one for happiness. Happiness equals one mouth in a garden with God. Now, where did they get that information? If they knew this after the flood, the people at Babel obviously knew it. Righteousness equals a lamb and me. Boat equals a vessel and eight people. Now, that's pretty specific. And it's embedded in the earliest. China is a continuous, it's crea it's a continuous society for, for centuries and centuries and centuries. So my conclusion here is that the people at Babel, even if they suppressed Seth, even if they put down the Noahic covenant, they knew something about it. And there's another source, amazing. Dr. William Schmidt wrote in 1930s, he, did a, he was a Roman Catholic monk who was trying to refute the idea that monotheism evolved from polytheism. So what he did, he did an experiment. He went into primitive tribes that had remained isolated from civilization, so they weren't contaminated with whatever was going on in the society around them. Here's what he says. Comparing primitive cultures with the later ones, we may lay down the general principle that in none of the latter is the supreme being to be found in so clear, so definite, vivid, and direct form as among the peoples belonging to the latter. We can establish the supreme being's existence among all pygmy tribes in the Asiatic and the African groups for the Negritos on Philippine Islands. Father Benefar has discovered a nocturnal liturgy addressed to the supreme being and couched in a sacred language no longer intelligible to the natives themselves. In the primitive cultures of the Arctic, the supreme being is everywhere recognized and worshiped. He appears among the three groups of primitive whose culture is related to the Arctic regions. In particular, the idea of created ex nihilo is known. A belief in the supreme being is an essential property of this, the most ancient of human cultures, which must have been deeply and strongly rooted in it at the very dawn of time. And of course, we would say the post-flood situation. So that's the positive side. And what we're trying to do here is visualize what were the people in Babel thinking when this happened. And we go and we get back into what Dr. Price said about those ziggurats and the fact that they, the, the people, the king, was the mediator. What does that sound like? A political leader who claims to be the mediator between heaven and earth. Isn't that a counterfeit of something? A counterfeit of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a, an antichrist. And here's a picture. Frankfurt was an Egyptologist at the University of Chicago years ago, and he has this in his book. The Egyptian state is not a man-made alternative to other forms of political organization. It was God-given, established when the earth was created. The word state was absent from the language because all the significant aspects of the state were concentrated in the king. He was the fountainhead of all authority all power, all wealth. The famous saying of Louis XIV, c'est moi, was levity and presumption when it was uttered, but it could have been offered by Pharaoh as a statement of fact in which his subjects concurred. That particular temple in Frankfurt's book, he explains it. That name, the, the Egyptian hieroglyphics there, is the name of Pharaoh Sahur. And on the right, you see what look like vertical lines. They're actually scepters. So that is a picture of his power, his scepters. Up above is the symbol of heaven, and down below is a symbol of earth. So here you have the mediator. So what we're saying here is, here's the ancient distortion at the beginning of our civilization of turning the state into a religious thing. And it's a pagan religion at that. Rush Dooney has some commentary on Daniel 2 and 3. And he says uh, this. What he's dealing with, by the way, here is we all know Daniel 2, you know, the structures with the four kingdoms and so on. But what he points out is if you go to Daniel 3, what does Nebuchadnezzar turn around and do? Right after Daniel's told him what the vision is, he makes a statue to himself. So he's uh, taking what Daniel said and he's reinterpreting it inside his pagan mind. 
and he turns himself into a divine ruler. History was Nebuchadnezzar's hands and derived its meaning from him. The priestly role of the Chaldean king as the great mediator has been reinforced by the dream in Daniel 2. As long as Nebuchadnezzar held sway, and I, I mention this because the political thing here, we see it going on today. Watch what he says. He was the head, the, he the hand, the head, the power and mind of God for his day. To bypass him in worship was to despise both God and God's incarnate glory. Other and peripheral worship of lesser powers was permissible only when Nebuchadnezzar's image and his glory were first acknowledged. Polytheism was a possibility and a part of religious, quote, toleration, provided the religion of the state was given its due, then all of the gods would have the leftovers. Think of our evangelical thing as the state begins more and more to dictate what we shall say. Daniel's three friends quickly found themselves as traitors to Nebuchadnezzar. The king had hoped to integrate these potential Jewish leaders into Babylonian culture through their three-year state-funded re-education course. Nebuchadnezzar sought to show his empire was for all nations, including Israel, but demanded their ultimate allegiance would be to him. In the first two cases of king of kings that you look up in the Bible, it wasn't talking about Jesus and the Messiah. King of kings is a term that was used of uh, media Persia and, and I think also uh, Babylon. But it has a gentle, it's a pagan context. Think of the word king of kings. That is internationalism. That is a claim global power. I will be a king and I will be a king over all the other kings. So it's a title and when it was applied to Jesus, obviously it's talking about Jesus as the global king. Now, what happened at Babel as far as the language goes? Just a quick conclusion. James Strickling wrote a distinction, and he wrote a paper many years ago, but he, he was investigating this confusion. The text states that the builder's speech was confounded. Judging from the name of the place, Babel, and his speech became a babel. This was not just collective babel of individuals speaking different languages, it was, a, um, it was a babble, literally. In other words, they apparently lost the power of coherent speech. They could only babble. Never, but then he has said an interesting thing. Neurolinguistics research into the effects of extremely low frequency and very low frequency electrical magnetic fields as neurons in the brain show that vocalization can be evoked by electrical stimulation, but these vocalizations are never words. Spontaneous language has not been evoked by cortical stimulation. Rather, corporal stimulation seems to act on our speech as though it was intruding noise into the process. So his, his thought, perhaps, is that what we've got here is that God, when he came down and saw the tower, he, boom, he wanted that construction stopped, and I want it stopped now. And the way to do it was everybody's babbling, and they can't even move a brick from one guy to the next because blah, 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 blah. And so it killed the coal construction project right away. And so now you have the fact that um, God then scatters the people, and language develops, and you have nations developed from that. So um, the, 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 here, here's just some of the summaries now of, of what happened in Babel. You have geophysical threats, earthquakes, and climate change. You have population health threats. You've got a theological departure from biblical revelation, and the state has been changed into the fact that Noah and God, when God gave to Noah the idea of if you murder a person, you, are, you will be murdered. And that was the f source of civil power. Government was installed after the flood. No sign of government before than perhaps angels messing around. But we have civil authority. How was the civil authority placed? What was its function? Let's think about that because that's one of the things that is distorted today. 
Civil authority was to suppress some forms of evil behavior. Why? Why did God do it? Because the first civilization ended in anarchy. So if God is going to concern his promise to Eve, that is his program of redemption, he can't have another episode of anarchy. The state was formed in order to deal with a fallen population and suppress to some degree evil behavior so that the gospel could go on and have some room to be finished. And what happens? We have, as a result of Babel, the temptation. It's like a second fall. The very tool that God gave us to suppress evil behavior now turns into a tool of redemption. And the state sees itself. It's all the stuff that Carl was talking about, that we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and so on, and it's all going to be one happy family on the globe. It's going to fail. We know it's going to fail. And Babel is our model. We can go back to Babel, and we can see what happens when you have this sort of thing. Um, and they don't have time to go into the discussion about how languages start. I just did have a linguist that took my course and framework and at Chafer Seminary, and uh, he was a guy that's been studying two languages. And just to show you the complexity of how hard it is to track languages, two languages are Korean and Japanese, and no, they don't know where they came from. The Japanese today use Chinese symbols, but it's not Chinese grammar. They've borrowed the symbols, but they don't have the grammar. And the grammar, he said, you know, it takes a lot of study, and I'm not sure of this, but it's suspiciously like Hebrew. And what's intriguing is that there are two customs in Japan. I have a Japanese daughter-in-law, so she's confirmed this. One thing they have annually, they have the interrupted sacrifice. And it's, a, it's enacted by Buddhist priests. They get a Buddhist teenager and they lay him on a, on a thing, you know, like a stretcher. And the Buddhist priest takes a sword and he starts to come down like this. And the other priest stops him and provides a sacrifice. Where did that custom come from? And then they also, the Tory gates of Japan, you see it on stamps, postal stamp, the arch. That arch is supposed to save you from the spirits. But what, what my students said, you go there and take a picture, you see red paint on both sides of it and red paint on the top. Doesn't that remind you of something? <laughs> so these are the customs, and it, it's, it's intriguing. And, you know, you guys may have an interest in doing this. The, the field is wide open to, to investigation that would be triggered, you know, from your... Um, you're just your interest and there's a whole areas of exciting exploration. I want to conclude um, with the um, things perhaps that we can do. Let me get a, the uh, page here. What do we do? If we think about the failure of a population at Babel and we compare the empires that have come and gone and come and gone, always with a messianic theme. Hitler was going to have the Third Reich, and he was going to subdue all the nations of Europe. Same thing, messianic version. Well, what's a, theolo what's a way of strategy to resist this incessant Babylon fantasy? I say there's, four, there's three steps. The first one goes back to what... Lutzer points out in his book, the local church that teaches the Bible has got to be the place where we come together, we have a support group, we have prayer being made. The Alliance Defending Freedom group of Christian attorneys that have fought case after case are calling for five to 10 million evangelicals to pray for the preservation of our rights. And they call for a generational change just as homeschooling 35 years ago was considered illegal by most states. Today, all 50 states guarantee it. You know how we got that? Because attorneys fi file suit in state after state after state, and it's created a generational freedom for homeschooling. Second thing, 
In Acts chapter 4, we have the biblical view of free speech. Peter refused to be quieted, refused to be canceled. He is going to continue to preach the gospel. Religious free speech is the source of liberties. It starts with that. Because if you're not free to discuss the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you've got suppression. And go ahead and keep on teaching it. Third thing of, of the four is in studying the fact that uh, Christian families, uh, Rod Dira uh, borrowed a, a thing from Solzhenitsyn, Live Not By Lies, and he wrote a book, and he was interested, how did Christian families survive communism? And he went back and he interviewed some of the older men now that were boys and girls that were raised in Christian homes. In particular, one of the cases is in um, Rhodesia, I mean, um, Romania. And um, he, he, he dealt with, what, how did you survive? The Soviets had our children all day long. We didn't have a chance to talk to our kids. And after school, they kept our kids in what they call Boy Scouts, but it was pioneer something or other, um, communist things, and all the way from kindergarten, all the way up into the universities. You know, that's 16 or 25 years of our life totally dominated by the state-run education system. And how do they survive? Because their moms and their dads, when the kids came home, when they ate dinner together, the mom and the dad would teach them about the Bible, they teach them about their history, and they'd always conclude, this older gentleman said, I can remember my mother, every conversation we had in our house after school, she always said, you won't hear this in school, and I don't want you telling the school that I've told you this. And so the youth rebelled and, and, and remained servant. And one of the most dramatic illustrations of the power of the family is 1956 when the Hungarians revolted against the Russians. Some, I remember in high school seeing, you know who led that revolt in 1956? College students who had spent all their life in a communist educational system. How the heck? Same thing. Their parents kept the faith in the home and they, the family was the leading resistance. And these kids got out there, they were throwing rocks when the Soviet tanks came in and killed 2,000 people in Budapest and crushed the revolution, but they didn't crush the spirit. Parents went right back after that. Some of them lost their children, they lost their boys and the girls, but they, they continued with the kids they had left to train them, train them. The family is the resistance cell, it's God's design that's where we retreat when the fourth divine institution of civil power is corrupted. We go back to the third power, which is the moms and the dads. And finally, the way we do it is we exercise our citizenship rights. We have rights, unlike some people. If you compare COVID, the Chinese communist virus, if you compare how that's being handled in Australia and Canada, two ex-British colonies, and then you compare it in our country, of the three, where's the most resistance? Here. Why? Because in our national history, we, are, we have rebelled. We have the belief that government should be limited. It's a Christian concept that the Founding Fathers wrote into the Constitution, the Declaration. The most important thing in our government structure is that first sentence. It is self-evident that God has created all people equal and given them unalienable rights. You know what that is? That's a claim of transcendent rights, rights that exist over and above and are superior to the state. That's embedded in our American culture and we need to continue that. And you know how we continue that? I think in our church, we've got three people, one running for the school board, one running for the county council, and we've got a, another one running in the state for a governor, and uh, he isn't in our church, that particular man. But he, you know how he came out of? He came out of the home, home school movement. And so get involved. First of all, be sure you're, you're voting, you have your voting rights, and you want a biblical precedent, 
for Christians claiming their rights. Look at Paul in the last half of Acts chapter 16. Do you know he led the first sit-in? He was arrested illegitimately. They violated his rights as a Roman citizen, and Paul refused to leave that jail until the local people came down and publicly confessed that they screwed up. And then Paul said, okay, now I'll leave town. So that shows you that the guy that wrote Romans 13 also shows us how to claim citizenship rights when there are rights to claim. Okay, that's all, and I think I've maybe exceeded my time here. You're fine. Charlie, you, in your thing about the, the timing of the 30, there are 39 genealogies in the Bible, and only two have uh, dates or numbers on them, which are Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. And uh, what you demonstrated, right, that when you add, in other words, you can go and add all the numbers up and they come up to 1,600 and something years. But if you add the age of Adam when Methuselah was born and add those two together, it comes up exactly the same, mm -hmm. showing that there are no gaps in the genealogies. Uh, do you have a comment on that? Well, in, the, in the book that... Um they did on the genealogies the, that uh, was published. Uh, they pointed out we normally use genealogies for dating for in First and Second Kings. Um, nobody has a problem there, so why do we have a problem here? I think a lot of it, uh, Tommy, is that we're so subjectively, I mean, think about it. Everybody here, those of you who were never homeschooled, those of you who had all your educational experience in secular education from K to 12, can you remember any time during your 13 years where you have ever had a teacher talk about the giving of the Ten Commandments? You did? He grew up in Oklahoma. So. Okay. You didn't uh, grow up in the... Well, I know, I, I, uh, in my, our area of the country, um, no, I've never had anybody say that they heard a teacher explain the Ten Commandments, which is the foundation of our, our law. Oh, well. Well, I guess I, I'm distorted because I lived on the, one of the coasts. <laughs> Long, Long Island, right? I remember Atlantic Monthly, which is a liberal magazine, interviewed Bob Thiem at Baraka Church during the Vietnam War when Baraka Church, under Thiem's pastorship, was sending hundreds of young men into the army. And so I remember the cover after they got through interviewing him. They had a picture of the building there of Baraka Church. And they made the mistake of asking Colonel Thiem, um, do you, pr do you tell your people how to vote? And he had a classic answer. No, I don't, teach, I don't uh, tell them how to vote. I teach them the Bible and they know how to vote. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, right there. Thank you, Charlie. I thoroughly enjoyed that presentation. That gives me enough to chew on for quite some time. The question I have is you were talking about the mindset or how the people at Babel thought. Do you think there's any connection between what happened in Genesis 6 and how they thought? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Wolke in his commentary on Genesis makes that point. He said there's three great Gothic events. One is, of course, the fall. The next one is Genesis 6 where you have Beni Elohim and the Gibors, uh, and then you have Babel. And in each case, man transgresses his, his, the boundaries. 
Satan is a finite creature. As a finite creature, he can't know the future. He doesn't even know himself because creatures, we have finite understanding. We don't know ourselves completely. This jazz that you get in psychology, psychiatry courses, know thyself. We can't know ourselves. Jeremiah said, you know yourself, you know how corruptible you are. So, so Walke makes that point that this is the same kind of thing, Genesis 6, same kind of thing, messing around with marriage messing around with, with, uh, with human, human, uh, human nature, and then you have Babel. Babel, I think, can be viewed as the fall for our civilization, like Genesis 3 is the fall for the first civilization. Corporate fall, so Co yeah. 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 Thank you. So, uh, Charlie, do you think Nimrod was the first king of kings or maybe commanding general? What was that? Nimrod. Do you yes. think he was the first king of kings or possibly commanding general? Well, uh, I know Josephus claims that Nimrod did lead it, and he calls him a gibor, which is the, like the name that was applied in Genesis 6. So, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell us, but we rely on, on, on these extra-biblical traditions. And it would make sense. He's a Canaanite. He's a, he's a guy that's in the wrong line. And whatever, whoever did it at Babel pulled off a, a great thing. He got total commitment on the part of the population to his project. Okay, well, you might expect that because I asked that question, I got a military background, which I do. I spent 31 years in the Marine Corps. So uh, one of the things that I've heard a lot about here so far is the oneness and the international overwhelming uh, force that, that is coming. But I don't think that has to happen in the church age. And, you know, we see a lot of problems in our country with tearing down monuments, tearing down uh, statues. We can resist that if we realize that we have to stand firm in our nationalism and support for our institutions. So I want to make sure we don't forget that today. Right. This is December 7th. We should remember Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And on that day, we lost over 2,000 servicemen, about 100 or so Marines. I firmly, firmly am convinced that if the Marines had known the attack was coming, they could have defeated the Japanese all by themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Robbie knows that. His dad fought on Iwo Jima. Probably still keeps that K-bar strapped on his thigh. So anyway, I just want to say Semper Fidelis, and remember Pearl Harbor. Oh, and, and don't anybody come up to me afterward and say the Marines are part of the Navy Department. <laughs> well, one of the what I'll about say is, that's right, the men's department. <laughs> one of the manifestations right now, because I followed the climate change movement pretty carefully, the last climate thing, because remember, what's going on here is that that's going to be the next thing after the virus. They're going to use climate change to end the fossil fuel cheap energy thing, and they're going to do all kinds of things telling us what to drive. Um, but here's something interesting. All the international conferences in the last five to ten years have failed because they can't get unity because of the different nations. India and China are still going through their industrial revolution. China is building 40 coal-fired electric plants. And the silliness, the absolute silliness of the government argument that we've got to get rid of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are the lifeblood of poor people. It's the cheapest form of energy that we can have. And a good example is the last two winters in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom said, oh, we've got to have a zero, zero contamination, a zero uh, fossil fuel kind of thing. So what did they do? They shut down their coal mines, and they shut down all their coal-fired power plants. You know what happened last winter? They had thousands of people dying of hypothermia. More people die from cold than they do from heat. And so this winter, they decide, gosh, we've got to do something. Well, they closed their coal mines down, so now they're buying coal 
from Europe at high price when they could dig it up right on in UK. And why are they doing it? Because they're trying to prevent. Because what happened in the winter time, they had cloudy weather. What happens to solar panels in cloudy weather? And the winds didn't blow. So what happens to your windmills? See, it's all, you're, you're making everybody vulnerable. And in the final analysis, this is a crushing weight on human population. It is evil. There's no set time. Climate has always changed. Climate, we, we, George Washington crossing the Delaware, you know that picture of Washington crossing? Do you notice what the Delaware River looked like in that painting? It was full of ice. That was the Little Ice Age. We started warming up out of the Little Ice Age in the early 1800s. How much fossil fuel were we burning in the 1800s? Last question. Yeah. First of all, I appreciate uh, the presentation. Uh, there are entire books written on how Genesis is, is buried in the Chinese language, so I really appreciate your uh, comments on that. But the question is, well, the, you pointed out the exponential decay curve in the, uh, in the ages uh, after Noah. Uh, and given the fact that two things, number one, nobody knew what an exponential decay curve was for thousands of years after that, you know, those genealogies had been written down, uh, begs the question that it, it's most likely true. It couldn't have been generated just by accident. And then second, uh, the fact that uh, folks like John Sanford and the genetic entropy concept have shown that uh, it's uh, the accumulation of mutations that, that give rise to that kind of exponential decay. Leads me to the inescapable conclusion that that data has to be truth. You couldn't have invented it and had it fit what we now know is a classic exponential decay curve. And uh, just curious about your thoughts on that. Well, when you read the paper, look at the footnote, because actually at that time, ancient people, Egypt, uh, had exponential solutions for their compound interest. And it's kind of a weird thing. But again, that was scattering about the thing. So anyways. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Okay.